Hi, my name is Stuart Magoo and I'm here today to talk to you uh, about how to fill out an attendance allowance form. So, quick background on attendance allowance. In case you have come along to find out a little about it, uh, it is a social security payment that is paid to people over the age of 65 if they can demonstrate that they have health conditions or disabilities that affect their day-to-day -day life in a significant way. So in uh, short terms, it's a disability benefit for people of pensionable age. So the benefit itself is not means tested, so you don't have to uh, put your earnings over or demonstrate how you spend your money or anything like that. It is a benefit that is awarded based on your health conditions, your disabilities and how they affect you throughout the day. Uh, you may be required to provide some medical evidence to support uh, your application in order to make it more likely to be successful. But essentially the main hub of the application is about you communicating exactly how your conditions are affecting you throughout the day. If you're able to do that in uh, a, a fairly clear way and you're successful, then you will get paid either the lower rate, which is around £55, or the higher rate, which is a little over £80. I'm not giving the exact figures because these figures change all the time and it might be that you're watching this video a year after I made it and the, the, the numbers are different. There are two rates with the benefit. Uh, these basically are the higher and lower rate. The difference between them is not the level of disability that you have, but on how long it affects you throughout the day and throughout the night as well. So if your disability only really affects you during the day when you're up and about, then uh, you'll get the lower rate. If your disabilities or health conditions affect you throughout the night as well and they cause you to have poor sleep, have to get up in the night, maybe change the sheets, things like that, then you may qualify for the higher rate. So essentially it's not an easy application to put together if you've never done anything like this before, which is why I've made this video to talk you through some of the uh, things that you might need to approach before sitting down to actually write it. Uh, and also some tips on how to actually form what you're saying and put it across in a clear and concise way. The uh, one of the main problems with attendance allowance, I think, for, for most people is getting the language right. Like I say, it is partly being clear and concise, but it's also drawing attention to the right things. And sometimes that can be tricky to do. What it will suggest is, before you go any further with this, have you looked into whether there's a local agency uh, or charitable service that might be able to support you in filling out the form and even do the work for you. Most uh, areas of the UK have an Age UK nearby and quite a few of them will offer a service where they will help you com complete the form. Not all will, but, so, but the majority do. So it's worth getting in touch with them locally. Uh, if you also, uh, you may have other charitable organisations that work with people with disabilities specifically, uh, possibly even some advocacy services that will also help out with completing the form. Equally, uh, if you have a condition that has specialist services attached to it, such as cancer, stroke or possibly dementia, it may be that, uh, say Macmillan, for example, or, uh, your, or the Alzheimer's Society, or even the NHS services that help you with your diagnosis and support may be able to complete the form for you. So it's worth checking to see if you can get some help before you jump into it, because it, uh, it can take a while. But if you are fairly 
confident with filling out forms and you're quite happy to do that maybe you're doing it for a parent uh, you know you've got the form someone's told you about it and uh, you you've just ordered it uh, if you order the form from the telephone number then the form will have a date on it which is the date that you call now if you use this form then the benefit that you get paid if you're successful will go from the date on that form okay so when uh, that date will have another date which is six weeks after the first date and that's when you have to complete the form and return it by in order to preserve that first date any benefit you then get paid will be paid from that first date that you contacted them if you download the form online and print it out or even use the the one that where you can type straight into the form and then print it out uh, if you if you go for either of those options then the date of the benefit will be paid from the date signed at the bottom of the form as long as it's within uh, a reasonable time of the postmark so uh, yeah that's that's likely when that would be paid from the whole process of applying for attendance allowance takes about eight weeks all told uh, sometimes a bit quicker sometimes a bit slower depends but generally about eight weeks and your first benefit payment tends to consist of back pay for the period of time that the application took and maybe even a little longer like I say if you uh, ordered the form over the telephone so so let's get into the form first of all this is the front now the uh, the one that you get through the post will look pretty similar to this but like I say just in this area here you will have uh, two date uh, marks there with uh, should be stamped dates in those uh, boxes and that will like I say indicate when you need to return the form back if you got it off from online like I have here and printed it out then uh, the front page will look like this the reason I'm using an online form is obviously because I'm doing this video I can hold up individual pages to show you. Uh, so the front of the form is pretty simple the, generally speaking the national insurance number is very important now if you're not sure when where to find your national insurance number or, or for, for your parents possibly or the person you're supporting if you're not sure where to find it uh, any letters to do with the pension uh, will have it on there if the person is receiving any kind of benefit payments such as a pension maybe pension credit things like that then any of those payments going into their bank account will have the national insurance number used as the reference for that payment so a quick look over a bank statement find where the payment is and you'll find the national insurance number it always starts with two letters and ends with a single letter so that's how you know which one it is okay so pretty easy to find uh, if you know where to look otherwise you can spend hours and hours going through drawers looking for envelopes believe me I've done it so like I say you need to pop in all of your uh, sort of information there contact details now I would suggest if you're filling this form out for somebody else and you're even representing them possibly you have power of attorney for them uh, maybe that person finds it difficult to speak on the phone because of a hearing problem or a mental health problem then make sure that you put the contact number for the person who's uh, responsible here okay because when the DWP pick up the phone the first person they will call is likely to be this number now it may be that the person that this form is about is perfectly happy to to talk and if so put their number uh, but the DWP sometimes just very occasionally they will phone people up just to ask them a few questions uh, it might be that there's a discrepancy on the form or uh, they just want to you know make sure that people are above board and things and they just pick random names out of a hat to give them a ring just to make sure they're doing due diligence to the job at hand so yes like I say pop that in there but also at the end note 
the name of the person that it's contacting so that they are aware that it's not, uh, say, let's say it's your mum, so they're not, they're aware it's not your mum. And then uh, maybe put mum's number in there as well, or specify do not call this number, <laughs> or something like that. There are details later on uh, for uh, putting in the information uh, about yourself as well, if you are representing someone, so we'll come to that very shortly. So the next page is all very standard stuff. I, generally speaking, don't meet a lot of people out here in Worcestershire who uh, have been out of the country for any period of time in the last few years. Uh, generally speaking, most of the people that are I'm filling the form in for are white British people and are quite elderly and disabled and probably haven't been very far and certainly if they have not for more than four weeks at a time. Generally speaking, most people have only been on holiday for a week, two weeks. However, if you have family overseas and you stay with family overseas for a long period of time, uh, then this is the, the next section you will need to fill in just to demonstrate your residential status. Um, the other questions are, you know, do you receive any benefits from the EU? In any or any other country so they just want to know if you're getting money from elsewhere uh, for your disabilities basically and also that you are a resident UK citizen and have been for a significant uh, number of days now you may be applying under special rules which is the next uh, page generally speaking most people aren't applying under special rules there's two reasons for this so special rules basically is if you have been diagnosed as having less than six months to live, then they will fast track your application. However, getting a doctor to stick their neck out and say that you've only got six months to live, even if it's patently obvious that you've only got six months to live, is very, very difficult to do because of the um, potential litigation that they may face if they were to actually turn out that you live nine months or ten years you know so it's very difficult to get the doctor to say yes this person only has six months to live uh, but if you can and they uh, they're able to do so uh, it's uh, basically what they call a DS1500 report so uh, you will need to basically uh, just get that document from your doctor, might be a GP, might be a specialist doctor, get that form from them, fill it out, sign the consent and declaration at the back of this and include it all and it's pretty much done. So uh, below that you've got the signing the form for someone else section which uh, if you can make out is at the bottom there and then the next page it's got the, the details of exactly uh, why it is that you're signing on someone else's behalf and there's lots of different options there. Fill in your name, your national insurance number, date of birth and your full address at the bottom. Uh, if you're a professional, if I was a professional uh, doing this then I might not put my national insurance number in but I might make it clear that I was uh, you know, working from a specific agency or company, something like that. So now we get down to probably the most difficult part of the form in my view. Um, and this is about your illnesses or disabilities and the treatments or help you get. Now you get this box with one, two, three, four, five, six. Now you might think that six boxes is enough to cover uh, the amount of disabilities and health concerns that you might have, but I think you'll find in most cases um, you're wrong. <laughs> Six boxes is not enough. So you are quite likely going to have to continue uh, with this information on uh, the sheet at the back in question 50, which I'll show you a bit later. Uh, it's basically a section for you to write in any extra things that you need to. So what's very frustrating about this is they waste three boxes giving you uh, demonstrations of what you should be writing in here. So this 
this section usually requires a lot of conversation and a lot of reading through uh, the prescription. Now, if somebody has a printed prescription, pop it in with this because it saves you a lot of filling out. Because what they want to know is what medications you're receiving for all of your health conditions. So, you must put in the, the health condition that you have and how long you've had it for or how long it's been causing you to have disabilities. So it may be that you've had the condition for 20 years but it's only the last two years that it's really become problematic and caused you disabilities. Uh, like for example COPD. You know you could develop that in your 40s being a heavy smoker and then it's not until you're in your late 60s that actually it's you can't walk up the stairs or breathe properly. So yes that would go in there. The inception of the condition and also the uh, when it started affecting you if that's different if it's the same obviously just put the, the same thing now talk through this what I tended to find when I was supporting a person who has many health conditions is actually they've got loads that count but they've completely forgotten about because they just get used to it so <laughs> Uh, even things like high blood pressure, if you're taking medication for it, it needs to go down in here because it does affect you, uh, even if you've got used to it, like I said. So quite often as you were filling out the form with the person in the later stages, you'd be jumping back to this page and adding in another health condition that they had forgotten about when you went through this section with them. So, so you may be doing that. So if you're writing it for someone, uh, sit down and go through all of this a few times sort of thing to uh, to get an idea of um, you know how many health conditions there are before you actually put pen to paper if you can um, if you've got the extra time so what I would say as well uh, is if you um, I'm going to pause because I've lost my mind right I'm back um, <laughs> I've remembered what I was going to say. So if you have got a prescription list, uh, then use that as much as possible uh, to guide you. So you could say, well, mum, what are you taking this for? And actually that's quite good because sometimes you can come across a medication that somebody should have stopped taking a while ago and uh, might be causing them problems, things like that. So it's a good way to review the medication, but also to, set, to find out about any conditions that people have just got used to. Uh, so that's what you do with that. Next section, have you seen a specialist in the last 12 months of any kind for anything? Uh, if you've seen more than one, then again you will continue basically copy, uh, repeating the same information that you would hear on the back, uh, at the back on question 50 where you've got extra space to fill in extra information. Some people aren't seeing a specialist at all, some people are seeing two or three, some just the one. Uh, you can see specialists for different things, you might be, uh, you might have macular degeneration and seeing specialists quite regularly at the eye hospital, and he's just maybe charting the development of cataracts as well, waiting for you to be ready to have the operation. Uh, it might be uh, you see a diabetic specialist, could be for your back, could be your knees, your liver, your kidney, whatever it is, uh, you need to, to fill it in there, but only if it's been in the last 12 months. If you saw a specialist for a condition and it was four years ago, then that doesn't matter. You know, if, if they've discharged you, you don't need to put their information in. The next question, do you, does anyone help you because of your illnesses or disabilities? So it might be a family member, friend, neighbor, uh, a paid carer could be anyone who's helping you on a daily basis with a lot of things their information can go in there sometimes this is the same person that's filling out the form uh, or the person if you're signing on your behalf maybe that's absolutely fine um, but as long as that information goes in there how often you see them and what help are they giving you so it might be the cleaning uh, it might be there helping you get washed and dressed, could be anything. It might just be taking you to the shops. But you can put that information in there if you want. So it's not essential. However, what is essential is 
the section at the bottom about your GP that you need to pop in there. Now quite often uh, you'll have a nominated GP but then you'll have a GP that you prefer to see who's a different one to your nominated GP and you will um, possibly even be seeing a completely different GP every time you, you call. The important thing is the address more than anything. Uh, so if you don't have a specific GP or someone you prefer, that's absolutely fine. You can leave that section blank or just put any GP or whatever it is. But as long as you've got the full address, postcode, their phone number, and when you last saw them, and that could be for anything. It might just be you went in for your diabetic screening or you went in for a blood test, that's fine. And it doesn't have to be an exact date. If they need to know, they will contact your GP and get that information from them. And then you've got your first consent form. So if you're signing for someone else, you would sign this. Uh, if you're filling this in for yourself, then obviously you need to sign this as well. And that just gives them consent to get in touch with your GP or any health professionals, should they require to. They don't always. They don't uh, necessarily need to. There's a question at the bottom. Do you have any reports about your illnesses or disabilities? If you have got anything to hand, uh, Send in a copy if you can, but the originals is fine as well. Um, tick that box and just list them at the back if you want to. If there's more than one, list them. If it's just the one, that's fine. And anything you do send in to them, always put your national insurance number at the top of the page. Okay. Are you on a waiting list for surgery? Answers itself. Have you had any tests for your illnesses or disabilities? So it might be a brain scan, a blood test, possibly would count if it was significant uh, in, in diagnosing your condition, which might be with, say, MS or something like that. Um, could be an X-ray, uh, could be a breath test if you've got COPD, whatever it is, anything that you did that uh, proved that you have whatever condition that you have, pop that in there, and even possibly one that led you up a garden path, I don't know. And then randomly, what kind of accommodation do you live in? Uh, literally just put house, bungalow, flat, care home. They don't need to know, oh, uh, a t three up, two down, semi with uh, attached garage. They don't care. They just want to know whether you have stairs or not, basically. So, where's the toilet in your house? Some people have one downstairs, some people have one upstairs, some people have one upstairs and downstairs, or even many upstairs and a couple downstairs. Uh, some people only live downstairs and they only have one toilet. Some people, uh, there are still some people who have toilets outside the property. Not many, but there still are some. And where do you sleep as well? This can be relevant, particularly if you live in a house and you've had to move your bed downstairs, uh, things like that. So um, again, so where do you sleep upstairs or downstairs? And then on the same page, all the aids and adaptations that you use. Now, an aid is anything from a walking stick to a grabber or a bottom wiper, fun things they are. Um, or uh, it might be something like uh, something to help you breathe properly. It might be an oxygen tank, could be anything like that. It might be a stair lift, it could be a magnifier, anything. If it helps you in some way because of your disability, it needs to go in here. This is another one of those sections that, as you go out, go through filling the rest, somebody mentions, oh, well, you know, I do use a walking stick when I'm doing this or that, and you go, oh, right, so you have got a walking stick, and have to go back and fill that in later. So, uh, I'm going to take a little pause for a second, uh, just to grab a drink, and then we'll carry on. Obviously, this is quite a long video. Uh, so, if you've not gone and made yourself a cup of tea, pop it on pause as well. Let's have a brew. Okay, I'm back and now we get down to the uh, nitty gritty. So this is help with your care needs during the day. And this is where you start putting in the detail about uh, how your uh, disabilities or health conditions affect you. Now the question says, uh, or, or the way that they word things are, uh, that you are receiving care or that uh, you have a need to receive care. It may be 
that you don't have any carers helping you do certain things. But that doesn't mean that you're not needing to receive some sort of care. It's a bit of an odd thing, but basically, if you are finding anything difficult, uh, then it needs to go in here, even if you're doing it all on your own. Uh, if you're having to make adjustments to the way that you do things or the way you used to do things, say when you were in your 40s or even when you were in your 20s, then that that's what we need to be talking about is those adjustments. So don't assume that because you're not receiving care or help from a, a specific individual person at any point during the day that... Um, that you that you're not, and actually you know, with husbands and wife couples, uh, we tend to find that actually they're supporting each other a lot without really thinking about the fact that they're doing that. So, um, you know, people say, "Oh, well, I don't get any care, so I don't need this." That might not be the case. So anyway, let's look at how you actually word an answer to a question. I'm not going to go through all of the questions because uh, they are quite weighty, a lot of them, and uh, it, it is a case of sort of really getting down to the nitty gritty on a few important ones so that you're not uh, completely bored out of your mind by the end of the video. I think we're at, what, 24 minutes, 29? So, yes, something like that with this thing, but I'm editing it as well, maybe different on your screen. So, um, the first question is, do you usually have difficulty or do you need help getting out of bed in the morning or getting into bed at night? Now, 90% of people that I will ask this question of will say, no, I'm fine. And I will say, well, are you? So run me through how you get in and out of bed. And what will generally happen is people will talk about everything around the actual act of getting in and out of bed. Sort of, you know, I'll, I'll go upstairs, I lock all the windows, I, you know. That's not what we're looking at. We're literally looking at the physical action of getting in and out of bed. And what's very common for somebody who is certainly past the age of, I would say, 70 to 75, around that point, is that when that person gets in and out of bed, uh, it may, they may do this because they've been told to by a health professional or because they've just naturally started doing it. But rather than just getting out of bed, getting up and walking off into the bathroom and doing whatever, uh, that person will wake up, they will sit there for a while thinking, oh my God. And then they will slowly turn their legs out of the side of the bed, plant the feet on the floor, and they will then sit there for a couple of moments until their head sort of comes to and stops swimming and then they'll try and stand up now when they stand up they will qu quite often use something to leverage themselves up so it might be that they push off the bed or that they push off the side table or that they uh, maybe they have a bar or something that they use to help them up uh, as they get to standing they may lean on something to balance themselves so it might be they lean on a windowsill if their bed's near a window or a cupboard door or a handle or a chair uh, just to steady themselves once they're stood and they'll stand for 20 10 seconds maybe just letting their head come to making sure they're solid before then starting to walk off if that's you you need to put that information in in that kind of detail so you would be saying when I awake in the morning I tend to have some stiffness in my back and in my legs and I tend to feel quite woozy. I slowly lift my legs out of the bed and place them firmly on the floor. When I feel that I have a good placement, I then leverage myself up to standing using the bedside table for support. Once I'm stood, I lean on the windowsill or transfer to my walking stick uh, until I feel balanced and then I move off slowly and carefully. So that would be how you would write that. Uh, if somebody, for example, has a mental health problem, uh, maybe they've developed dementia, this might be where you would say they wake up in the morning but they're very confused, I have to reassure them. Uh, it may be that you say, uh, 
I wake up in the morning and I am confused and my wife needs to reassure me. It's always best to write it from the uh, singular I point of view rather than we do this for my dad and we do that for him, preferably. But whichever way is fine as long as the detail is there. So, uh, so that would be getting out of bed. It's always best to start with getting out of bed because when you say getting into bed, people sort of misunderstand what that means. So if you start with getting into bed, that usually makes this question go a bit easier. Uh, what I would say is, well, um, when it comes to getting into bed at night, if somebody is having difficulty with changing their clothes in getting into bed at night, there's a section that covers that later, so you don't need to put that in here. Again, it's just the physical act of getting into bed. And again, the most common way of, uh, of the thing that is written in that way is usually uh, I pull the covers back on the bed, I then sit on the edge of the bed, I gently raise my legs into the bed whilst turning, I then shuffle backwards and lower myself down into the bed to sleep. And it may be that somebody has a specific uh, injury or uh, some arthritis or something that causes them pain and they have to sleep in a certain position or they have to use cushions to bolster their position in a certain way for them to have a comfortable sleep. Um, that, that is as far as it goes. You don't need to talk in this section about what happens through the night. If you wake up during the night, there's a section for that later on, so you don't need to go into that detail here. Okay. So, toilet needs is question 28. Um, this is fairly self-explanatory. Obviously, if you're having any difficulty using the toilet, if you have any incontinence issues, if you have to wear pads, or uh, any of those things, obviously they will go in here. Again, the same if you're wearing a catheter, anything like that, or if you need help in any way to do these things. Uh, the other thing that people don't often consider when going to the bathroom uh, that is an issue is getting on and off the toilet. Now, getting in and out of a chair is something that we will talk about later, but getting on and off the toilet works in the same way. You know, if you can get stuck on the toilet because your back freezes up, or you have to lean on a sink, or uh, grab a handle, or even have a toilet frame installed to get on and off the toilet, then also that needs a mention here as well. Next question after that is washing, bathing, showering, or looking after your appearance. Uh, again, this is all fairly self-explanatory, but there is detail that you won't think of as well. Does somebody have to sit down in the shower? Uh, are they able to wash their hair themselves? Do they have a hairdresser come in once every week just to wash their hair? Uh, do they have difficulty with cutting their toenails or keeping their toe toenails and fingernails clean? Uh, have they got an aversion to washing, uh, which may have developed if they have dementia and their personal care might be quite bad. So this section actually there, that can tell you a lot about a person and what sort of condition they're in. So this section is very important, very important. Quite often people are just having a strip wash every day because they find having a shower or a bath far too taxing whereas they used to prefer to have a shower every day. It's worth mentioning that. There's a big change where somebody would shower every day, but because of this problem, now they just have a strip wash and maybe daughter comes up to help them have a shower on a, on a Saturday, then that change needs to be uh, identified in there. Okay. The... Uh, Next question after that is dressing and undressing, and this is also very similar. Um, also be thinking of those things, you know, do you have difficulty putting on your socks, putting on your underwear, putting on shoes, have your feet swollen, are your shoes too big now, do you wear slippers all the time, um, do you need help with putting on your coat, getting the arm in, you know, do you have difficulty with buttons, are they fiddly, uh, have you got arthritis in your fingers, does it make doing a button up difficult? Uh, Dementia, again, do you have difficulty selecting clothes, knowing when to change them, knowing when they're dirty, that sort of thing. So, again, 
put all that information in there in as much detail as you possibly can. Think of anything, even if it's a small thing, pop it in there. Moving around indoors, again, is a fairly self-explanatory one. Uh, they, they're not too concerned with how you move around outside, because if you can't move around very well indoors, then you're not going to be moving around very well outside. Plus, there isn't a mobility uh, payment within attendance allowance, which you have with personal independence payment, which is paid to people under 65. Um, I could get into the reasons as to why that's the case. Uh, it could be a bit political, so I won't do that. But uh, you, you're just having to demonstrate here that around the home you have difficulty moving about. So it might be that you always use a walking stick when you move around, or it might be that you sort of furniture walk by supporting yourself on different bits of furniture as you go to and from the kitchen uh, or the bathroom or something like that. Getting in and out of a chair, again, this is like ending off a toilet. Can you do that without pushing yourself like this to get up? And once you're up, do you sometimes go up and then fall back as you're doing it? You know, things like that. Do you need help or assistance to do that? Same again, we're going up and down the stairs. You know, do you need to hold onto a banister or two? Or go one at a time? Or a stairs just to know for you? You know, whatever that is. And again, putting the detail there, it doesn't hurt to mention that outside somebody is very likely to uh, stumble or trip if their vision is bad, and that that can occur inside the house as well, on occasion, uh, but less so because they know, know their house quite well, so it might be worth saying something like that. Uh, equally, uh, you may talk about the will to move around. It might be that somebody is capable of moving, but because of maybe dementia, they don't. They just sit in the chair, staring out of the window. Um, you know, so that equally would would be mentioned there. You know, you, you might be needed to remind to move or encourage to move. All of that information goes in there. Do you fall or stumble? Now, many people fall and don't realise that they fall. Okay, so a fall is classed as as soon as you lose your balance and uh, sort of go downwards towards the ground when gravity takes over basically so if you fall but you catch yourself against the wall you still had a fall you just didn't hit the floor so or if somebody has caught you because they were stood next to you or holding on to you you had a fall you just didn't hit the floor so you need to think about those things. Stumbles as well. Do you trip or stumble? Do you have difficulty with viewing different colours on the pavement to, to notice when it's a step? Things like that. Um, you know, all very important. But certainly, if, if you hit the ground for any reason, you have had a fall. And I've met quite a few people say, no, I just, I just sat down. I just sat down. Yeah, you did, but you didn't do that willingly. You know, that was gravity that made you sit down. Uh, so that's a fall. And it's indicative of uh, a place that you have uh, reached in life, unfortunately. Uh, generally, when people have got to the point where they become quite frail, then falls are much, much more likely and much more devastating when they occur. I mean, most of us uh, don't don't fall that much on a day-to-day -day basis but actually if uh, if you think about it uh, if you're 40 50 years old you probably do have quite a couple of trips and falls and things like that you're just usually able to catch yourself and recover pretty quickly sort of thing so older people can't catch themselves necessarily and certainly take a long time to recover from a fall so it's very important that the information goes in there about that even if it's just occasional and you've just had one last year then that needs to be said and what caused the fall was it a trip or was it that you just don't know why you fell quite often i get i just found myself on the floor sort of thing so you know it may be that you don't know why you fell and that's absolutely fine to say uh, i don't know what the cause of that was if it if you genuinely believe it was just a one-off trip then, or you've not had any falls, then yeah, leave that section blank. You don't have to fill it in. But, uh, you know, if you are, just tell the truth. It's fine. No one cares. 
in a negative way. Um, no one's judging you. So uh, any help you might need with medicines, again, fairly self-explanatory. You might have a box that organises it for the days of the week and the times of day, and you just pop out what you need that needs to go in. It might be that you need someone to help you apply cream or put on eye drops, or um, you know, uh, it might be that you're not able to use the box and they have to do all the medication for you. That's fine. That's fine. Again, medical treatment might be physiotherapy, uh, it might be that you have to do exercises every day or that you have to be reminded to do them every day. Stuff like that. So there's lots of uh, information that needs to go in there. Again, it's just about the support you need for your medication. All the medication information should have gone in at the start of the section. So then there's a section on communication. Again, this is a very simple section. Uh, do you need to have somebody... Uh, help you with understanding people you don't know very well uh, could be because of a hearing problem or a sight problem it might be that you're not able to read your own mail someone reads it for you uh, it could be your memory that somebody needs to remind you of things uh, it could be filling in forms like not necessarily like this because this is difficult for everyone but simple things um, writing letters you know uh, responding to correspondence, you know, getting on the phone to the gas board and say, oh, I never spent that much on my gas this year. So, you know, it might, whatever it is, if you, if you need help, then obviously that goes in there. There is a specific question as well about British Sign Language. So, um, yeah, pop all that in there. So, uh, do you need help from another person to actively take in part, take part in hobbies, interests, or social or religious activities? Um, you could claim that cleaning your house was a hobby, possibly, uh, but generally that wouldn't go in this section, and they're not really interested as to whether you have a cleaner or not. How can you clean your house? Um, they uh, assume that if you're having all of these difficulties then cleaning is probably going to be not top of your list of things to do so that doesn't really need saying but it might be that you're a keen gardener and you've had to start getting the gardener in and maybe they do the heavy stuff and you just do your little pots you know or something like that or you just like to sit in the garden now and let them do all the work even though it's something that was a big passion for you important to put it in there any, any hobbies or interests that you've had to give up because of your uh, illnesses or disabilities, they have to go in there as well. You can't see, I'm pointing like this, but, but it's below the thing, so you can't see. Um, so that has to go in there as well. And then, uh, obviously, if you're attending any hobbies or clubs or doing anything where somebody helps you do that, so it might just be that you get the dialer ride service to take you somewhere, uh, but then the people that are wherever you're going are looking after you while you're there. So that might be something that you put in. Maybe you go to a day centre, uh, maybe it's uh, a bowling club, but you need to have your son or daughter drive you there and back uh, because you're not able to drive at night because of macular degeneration or whatever. Could be anything that goes in there. What are we looking at now? Oh, bloody hell, this is a long video. Do you need someone to keep an eye on you? Fairly self-explanatory. This also includes people phoning up to check on you throughout the day. It doesn't have to be somebody actually being there staring at you. But again, they're looking at what the reasons are for you needing to have someone keep an eye on you. Uh, to prevent danger uh, to yourself or others, or that you're not aware of common dangers, or that you might harm yourself or neglect yourself, or you might be antisocial in some way, have fits, dizzy spells, blackouts, confusion, or experience thoughts or voices that disrupt your thinking. It doesn't have to be voices, I have to say, just with this last question. So if somebody uh, has dementia and they're, you know, maybe they're affected in such a way that they're having a conversation with you and all of a sudden they don't know what, what were we talking about? Or, you know, and you get that sort of thing, then that would count here. Uh, it would also count under confusion, but it might be that somebody 
obsesses on something when they never used to obsess about things before. They might get paranoid and phone you at 10 o'clock at night. There's people arguing in my lounge. You know, well, turn, turn off EastEnders and you'll be fine. Um, these things have happened. So, yeah, again, as much information as possible. If uh, Dad needs to be reminded when he's doing his cooking to take the pan off the stove, uh, or you've had to maybe put in devices that monitor Dad as he's moving around the house, so it might be like a kettle monitor so that you know that he's got up in the morning to make himself a cup of tea, something like that. All that kind of stuff can go in here. Now the night section, we're pretty close to the end now, don't worry. Uh, the night section, anything can go in here, literally anything. So as long as it happens after you go to bed, so it could be you wake up at two in the morning and wander around the house, you don't know what the time of day is, it might be uh, that you have bowel problems, you may be incontinent, someone needs to change your sheets halfway through the night, could be that you get severe pains or cramps and you need to, regularly and you need to you know have someone massage your leg for you or it wakes you up or you just don't sleep properly maybe you've got you know bad indigestion could be headaches could be back pain could be anything if it gets you up and you're up for more than you know five, two two or three minutes at a time then it's worth mentioning here if you're just getting up, pop into the loop, getting back to bed, and going back off to sleep, then that's not an issue. Even if you do that two, two or three times, if it doesn't take you more than a couple of minutes each time, they're not going to be too worried. But if you're waking up and not getting back to sleep, uh, if that's affecting you or somebody else uh, as well, and affecting you the next day that you're really tired and you know you're not functioning as well as you might if you had a good night's sleep then this section is for you and this one's a bit more complex as they give you how often do you get up at night so you've got to tick the relevant boxes and give the amount of minutes and they literally add that up and that gives them an idea of whether you just host uh, the night uh, component as well uh, the higher rate and again does someone need to watch over you at night so you know it's it's exactly the same as the other one uh, during the day uh, but they're looking at how long that person has to be awake so you know if husband or wife has to be up to look after the other one for an hour then that's affecting them as well and so um, you know they may need um, extra supports themselves so uh, that those are all of the questions the main thing like I say is to be as detailed as possible and ask as many questions as possible and look at all of those things that are adjustments it may be that you say I'm fine doing this well you might be fine but have you had to make significant changes in order to keep doing that thing you know if it takes you half an hour to get dressed in the morning or even 20 minutes or 10 minutes where previously it only took you two then that's something that needs mentioning um, and again right from the eye I do this I do that I do the other if you can it just makes it easy particularly if the person is signing the form for themselves or, if, or obviously if it's you filling out your own form then uh, then you would write in that way anyway so uh, like I say there's uh, there's no real limit on the amount of information that you can give other than the box uh, that's provided. Luckily there is section 44 where you can carry on and add extra information here or it might be information that you think is pertinent that hasn't been covered in the question at this point that uh, as I say the information that goes on in there is uh, you know it throughout the form is information that will define whether you have a disability or not but for people with dementia particularly or something that's a little bit rare or a bit different this section you might want to put in a bit more information so for someone with dementia there's no section in there to say uh, specifically well um, 
you know, throughout the day I get a million phone calls off my dad worrying about things because he ha can't remember that he phoned me 20 minutes ago, sort of thing, uh, and, and the effect that that might be having on you. They're not too concerned with the emotional side of things unless it's having a detrimental effect on the carer's ability to provide care, basically. So um, any, any extra things can go in there if needs be. And uh, obviously they want to know if you've been in a hospital or a care home recently. And uh, then you've got section 50, which is, as I say, they're smaller now. It used to be two pages. Now it's just one and it's not even the whole page. But any extra information that you need to put in about health conditions, specialists, doctors, uh, medication, anything like that, you list it here. Uh, if you're working on a printed form, then uh, you know print out two of these pages. You can add extra sheets if necessary. Just again, always put the national insurance number at the top of the form. And then your final section. I agree that everything I've said is true, so help me God, or whoever. And sign the date, print your name. If you send in documents, you can put a list of them on that back page, and that's it, you're done. So send that off within... Uh, make sure you take a copy when you send it off, before you send it off. Uh, you can send it recorded delivery if you want, but generally speaking, attendance allowance forms don't go missing that often. I did have two go missing over the years, so having those copies... Uh, really helped out in those situations. I actually had three go missing and one where I hadn't taken a copy when I first started uh, doing this sort of thing and that, that was difficult because we had to do the whole thing again. Uh, but for most people, as I say, it is just a case of fill out the form, pop it in the post. If you've got an envelope provided, then that's great. If not, the address is on the form and on the website from where you download it from. And I think it's free post. You, uh, it used to be that you got a holding letter telling you that they received it. They don't do that anymore as far as I'm aware. So if you want to give them a call on the number that's provided, then they'll let you know whether they've received it or not. It's best to do that about three weeks after you send it off. And uh, sometimes actually by that point it's been processed and done. Just depends on the form. The more detail the better. Uh, as I say, somebody may give you a call to check some of the details and things that are put in there, particularly if you are speaking on behalf of somebody else. If you have power of attorney and you're speaking on behalf of someone else, then uh, you'll need to possibly give them copies of that as well. So um, see how you get on. Let me know if uh, this video has been helpful to you. Uh, I'm hoping that I've edited it down to enough that uh, it's not too stressful to watch or that you can just flick through with a little red bar at the bottom and uh, just just look at the sections that you, you need to. So good luck with the application and uh, like, share and subscribe if you can please and look out for more videos from me in the future. Okay, have a great day. Take care.